He was uh, really encouraged and pushed by uh, Gary to uh, be active to this conference. I had the pleasure to be invited uh, a couple of months ago, in fact, last year in uh, Geneva, when we had uh, a kind of introduction with other colleagues uh, and to present there to the member states and to the partners um, uh, the idea of uh, this kind of uh, dialogue between uh, the guests of the World Academy of Art and Science, the friends and the members and the guests of World Academy of Art and Science and the uh, United Nations in Geneva. I was really uh, impressed and surprised to see the interest there in Geneva, but also I followed yesterday and today the conference and I'll do this uh, next week. And I'm really happy the interest for the topic is um, uh, high. Also, I was, uh, and I am challenged by the question which was not designed by me, the question of our session. Uh, Gary and the team came up with this uh, question. And uh, in my opinion, it's a question for which I don't know an answer, to be clear from the beginning. And mm -hmm. if I would have uh, had a good answer, probably, uh, and who, who has the answer, probably will be eligible for Nobel Prize. And uh, let me start and use uh, probably 90 seconds, which I still have uh, in my intervention by uh, sharing with you an experience while I was student in the United States at the Graduate School of Education and Human Development, George Washington University. At one moment, one of the topic of a seminar activity was the following question. What's the meaning of a university? And I was a young, coming from a former communist country, graduating teacher training program. And the question for me before to attend the seminar, uh, it was a kind of stupid question. Why we question what's the meaning of a university? The university is there with buildings, with professors, with students, and we get a diploma and that's the meaning of a university. After the seminar, I was really shamed for not being able to understand the, the meaning of the question before to understand the meaning of the university. And since that moment, which happened almost 20 years ago, all the time I'm questioning what's the meaning of the school, what's the meaning of the education, what's the meaning of what we are doing, and to understand the permanent mobile um, uh, um, actors in the education uh, uh, sector. Uh, and it happened, I was, uh, I worked in the Ministry of Education on different positions, including Deputy Minister and Minister, why I mention this, without being politically involved, because I've had the chance to interact with probably thousands of people in Romania and outside. And even though we use exactly the same words, we have different meanings for these words. So, Practically now, and I'll stop here and to pass to my colleague, uh, we are, I, I like the challenge and I'm really looking forward to see your opinions on this uh, uh, question. Thank you very much. Mr. Kinsner, you, you have the floor. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, I have a few words to introduce everybody so we won't have to re reintroduce ourselves all, uh, at all times. But again, this is a very important question that uh, Gary asked and many others asked uh, in the past. And very often there is no answer. Um, perhaps because of the understanding of the question and then the uh, understanding of possible answers. Um, as you know, this is a critical and maybe even um, existential question. If we will not be able to do it, we probably won't be able to reach the objectives. Uh, uh, Ramus uh, articulated it very beaut beautifully in one of his keynote speeches um, when he mentioned, uh, 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 recalled the <clears throat> Uh, preface to the Const Constitution of U UNESCO um, that states that since all wars start in the minds of people, we must uh, build peace in the mind of people. 
and peace, the coexistence to create and co-create and fix this planet is the objective that is worth living for. I think um, the panelists today that will be addressing those issues are Pavel, um, and he has developed many beautiful things um, with the uh, with various views that are extremely important today. Uh, Marcel van der Verde, who also has done many, many beautiful things um, in the past. Uh, Sue Henderson, the president of New Jersey City University, uh, also has done many, uh, provided many contributions. As you have seen, uh, Alberto Zucconi also has changed the world to a great extent and is, will not stop continuing that, doing that. And that the smile obviously is contagious. And you might have noticed that I've selected all of those individuals with smiles. Um, mm -hmm. Carol has participated in a few uh, sessions and her contributions on a daily basis are just formidable in order to bring this. Lisa also has done so many things, so many beautiful things in the past, I uh, will be uh, uh, very privileged to hear it. And a very, uh, not a very long time ago, uh, Robert Zinger has, um, has become the chair uh, of the World Ward um, that also uh, promoted educating for life to be able to fix, not to uh, be want to fix, but be able to fix uh, the process of better living. Uh, Janani, you've, you've seen her face many times and have seen her contributions, um, tremendous contributions in the past. It's a pleasure to see you also today. Uh, Valerie Annan, who uh, also has contributed in a number of different ways. And uh, you, you saw uh, Lilac, uh, who has contributed many, many beautiful things. And uh, I uh, was excited to read the from global disruption to disruptive innovation in education and um, the perception of what educators actually mean. And uh, I like this very much dare to dream idea. Thank you for it. Um, and then Alexander Schiefer, who has uh, co-founded uh, Transform. Um, and in his uh, discussions and articulation of the philosophy, holistic education with the integral development of humanity and the purpose that is deep, uh, it's also a pleasure to have you over here. Um, so uh, the, uh, as you have noticed, the introduction was from Remus. Uh, I'd, wouldn't be able to describe all of his contributions today because they were so so rich and, and extensive. And again, his knowledge of the area is extensive. And um, I've been trying to contribute a little bit with the idea, for me, education is existential, not only quintessential. So I, I think that's where I would stop. Thank you. Um, and we probably have not exceeded too much my time slot. So, Ramos, uh, uh, can you hear me now? I have removed my slides. Yeah, I can still? hear you. Okay, thank you. So, so perhaps we, you could you could encourage people now to open um, the floor for for our yeah. uh, discussion of, of points, positions. So let's uh, let's. Uh, uh, my proposal is to follow the order from the, the schedule. So Pavel, you you have the floor. You don't have I it. I think pa Pavel. Marcel. Marcel van der Word. Unmute uh, your mic. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. Good evening to everybody. Um, I just would like to um, give a vision about what kind of uh, um, university that we need in the future. That means the so-called uh, um, transformation from where we are to the world university. If you look in general, that like politics, 
that is on an international scale between China and America. And the, um, the same thing in economics, everything is international. But if we look a little bit about the educational aspect, that is more, mainly regional. That is in a specific area. Sometimes it is national, in Italy national, or in France national. And uh, we have also some European in the directions where the education got a kind of a European dimension, but in principle it is still national. Between the continents we don't have anything. So in principle we have to go from the present system, the present university system, that is the local, local area, how to go then to the world situation, to the world university. Now, in order to do that, there are some conditions or some criteria. One of the criteria, the first one is, you know, if you want, would like to, like Europe to China or to Russia, uh, you need to have the language. There should have been a possibility to communicate, so that means the language. Uh, um, but the language is not sufficient. I remember that in Europe, when we had Germany to France, when a German who speaks fantastically good French was talking to a Frenchman in negotiations of science, in many cases they didn't understood each other, even if the language was the same. So you, you need more than the language, also the, the culture. And in addition to the so-called culture, you need more or less to know a, um, what the other person is. You should also recognize the people in order to get a kind of an agreement. So what is principally needed in order to go and what are the criteria for a world a university, a world academy? That is that you must be able to talk to the other people from the other planet, from the other planet, that you must also know these people, that you must also recognize them. If you talk to somebody in the scientific field, then it is very important that they, um, if you talk to, if an engineer, for example, talks to another engineer, he should know uh, uh, what type of engineer it is. We in Europe in the past, in Italy, you could have an engineering degree for three years, while in Germany it is seven years. What we have created in, U in Europe is a uniform system that is called the, um, a, a kind of a uniformity, so that we have in Europe the whole system the same like bachelor and master and PhD. That is what we have created. It was absolutely impossible, the Bologna Declaration. When I prepared the first text on the Bologna Declaration, people in Europe called me crazy. But finally, it is now there. We have the same uniformity system in Europe between the universities. So we know that an engineer in France, we know what, what it means. And an engineer in Finland, we are now quite similar. Now, with the uniformity, the second step what you have to do is, well, the first step is a uniformity between China, the United States, and, and other countries to have a similar kind of uniformity system in their education, as well in engineering as for human sciences. The second criteria, what is, what is needed, that is a kind of the, the programs you should have at the university similar kind of programs. At the end, we in Europe, we have said bachelor, master, PhD for everybody, for the whole country, similar to the United States. Now we should find a system which is worldwide. That means we should find a system between China and Russia and all and other continents. We should try to find a kind of a similar system so that we could really compare them in such a way that, for example, if you look about, if, for example, in Europe, you study somewhere at La Sapienza University in Rome, and you study there two years, then you can make your third year in Finland. And Finland has to recognize it, and La Sapienza has to recognize it. So you could move from one to the other. That is also what we would need in the world that is between Europe, that somebody from Belgium studies two years there, and you go to Tokyo University, and he works then the third year or the fourth year. 
that is another criteria what we need worldwide. So principally, what we need, the criteria is you need some languages. Now, in respect to the programming languages, my great-children, and I have nine, between 15 and 20, they all say six, seven languages. There is no problem for young people to speak languages. If we recruit at the European Union, for example, it is, we will not recruit somebody who only speaks two languages. We will get people who are intelligent. So what we need is that in our program, we should have a few languages, common languages, so that you can communicate with your Chinese person. And at the same time, if you have the same uniformity at the university, you could change a lot. So in principle, if the criteria is there, then the problem is how are we now doing it? How are we now creating it? Ha, there is no country who has the money to make a world university. There is no who will do it. But I think we have now been studying that for in details and we have now two possibilities to create really the university worldwide. And what are those? Now, from the beginning, when I was listening yesterday morning to the, uh, to the conferences, many people said, or the majority of the people, and probably you too, they said, oh, we should eliminate the United Nations. We should create a new, another United Nations. We should change everything. And there are no possibilities to do that. That is what I understood from the conference. But there was then also the chief of cabinet from the United States who also had to speak and say, look, that's absolutely impossible to change and to damage the United Nations. By the way, the United Nations have done quite a good job, but certainly failures. So how do we create it? Now into the United Nations, that is what we are working, and we have been done a lot of work already into that way, together with the Davos meeting, together with the OECD, together with a number of international organizations, with the European Rectors meeting. We have done quite a certain amount of steps into that direction. So what should be done? My proposal is very simply, you cannot damage or you cannot eliminate the United Nations. But in the United Nations, there are two bodies. You know, UNESCO is one of those. Now, the point is about the UNESCO. There are many countries who are not so happy with the UNESCO, and they would like to have another UNESCO. Now, in respect to the so-called other UNESCO, there is a certain possibility that the UNESCO could become a kind of a reform UNESCO that we could eliminate. That is probably too far. Eliminate UNESCO and that we could transfer the UNESCO into one of the world universities. And there is also a second one. I am, I am a fan of UNESCO, but we agreed we will have a round of two, three minutes, and after okay. that we can come back. Okay, I, can, I still finish now. The point yeah. is you have UNESCO, but you have also the United, the UN University in Tokyo. Probably you don't know that that exists. And not many people knows that the UNU exists. Now, what are they doing? So what is UNESCO doing? What are they doing? And I think that is one pillar in order to create the world university system. And the second one is there is also a way to get it in private situations. Last November, we had Google was looking for the best people in the world. And they only find 30% of those people. 70% they couldn't do anything of these people. What was, UNESCO, what was Google saying? Oh, we have to build our own university and that is what they did. So I can tell you there is also private money available. Not only Google, but there are many companies already prepared in order to support this kind of system. And maybe in the point of, in the time I have for the questions, you can put some questions, but we are really very far in order to realize this kind of situation. That's what I see how we should go to the world universities where the best people in the world will be trained. And to close it, in Europe, we have in Brugge, in Belgium, we train there the politicians and many ministers from European countries have been trained in Brugge. 
If you look about, if it goes for culture, we have also a European college in Italy, in Florence. And there, the people who come from that school are the best people in the, edu in the kind of the culture, kind of topics in Europe. We have a third one that is in Poland. So we have already those on a European basis. And I think we have to extrapolate it worldwide and to create those universities. And I can tell you that we are already in a good way to go to this stipend. And there is a lot of interest. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you for the, that I took a little bit more time. Sorry. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Alberto, please, if you would like to go further. Okay. Uh, uh, the question uh, uh, in three minutes is not easy to give a uh, you know, significant answer. But I would say I would not start uh, from the context because uh, a university, as Ramos uh, you know, put it very nicely, what is, is uh, a university? Depending on what kind of pedagogy has a university. And that would determine in my mind uh, if that university is part of the problem uh, or the solution that is supposed to help uh, people to get uh, the knowledge and the skill about. Every pedagogy has uh, embedded uh, a vision of human nature. Look at the pedagogy of every dictatorship. And uh, that uh, will become even evident. To give you just an example, do, doing uh, Italian fascism uh, was uh, forbidden to teach uh, psychology at the university because it was competing uh, with uh, what they call a fascist mystique the vision, uh, male-oriented vision uh, of the hero that uh, was bringing fascism uh, to a needed world. So, not only that, but uh, uh, I think uh, you have to decide uh, if uh, in the university, choosing the pedagogy, you're going to have a professor, teachers, uh, which I think often are part of the problem, eh? or facilitator of learning. We have a lot of knowledge eh? and a scientific research eh? that often eh? we train eh? people and give them an degree, and they come out eh? and they are blind. And so when they become eh? politician, eh? businessman, eh? professional, not because they are mean, eh? but uh, they're made blind uh, by having received an obsolete uh, uh, knowledge that we know is not valid uh, since uh, the last uh, uh, 20s uh, when uh, physics uh, discovered we live uh, in a relational universe. So we have uh, to promote a community of learners uh, that are, you know, more than temple of knowledge, uh, temple of learning, uh, and a temple of uh, developing a critical thinking, uh, creativity, resilience. So, and understand that, uh, you know, it cannot be even uh, I'm for holistic uh, systemic vision. But it would be wrong uh, to have uh, one vision all over the world. We, did, we need a polyphonic uh, uh, offering to different epistemic communities that are in contact and cross-pollinate each other. Uh, I think uh, that uh, the Bologna process, uh, you know, my friend uh, Marcel was talking about Europe. Uh, well, Europe uh, has... Uh, uh, since many years ago, launched the, the Bologna process uh, for a knowledge society. And they publish reports. I read them, uh, and if you read their reports, uh, the reports say, we're not doing a good job. We promise to deliver, but we are not. Why? We still are professor- We still have 30 seconds. 
and not the student centric. We need the student person centric uh, temples of learning, uh, not obsolete uh, teaching uh, realities. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Alberto, including for your uh, very sharp intervention. Robert, let's follow the. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I, I'll present a, a little bit a different uh, view from uh, Marcel's. We at Org, we are a global organization driven by Jewish values. And uh, we have uh, 140 years of experience uh, behind us uh, celebrating uh, this year. Uh, Org's mission is uh, in transforming lives uh, through education and uh, training. And our vision is to place the future in the hands of the next generation of uh, people and it's very relevant to this discussion. Uh, we reach about 300,000 uh, people every year in uh, more than 30 countries. So we do have a global view of what is happening, uh, what is happening in uh, this field. Uh, and um, our main, one of our main goals is really to bridge between the ability and the opportunity. And that's what uh, was just uh, discussed. I, I want to give a few, uh, maybe a few examples that will give it uh, uh, proper uh, the context. Uh, our university, for example, in Montevideo, in uh, Uruguay, just last week was ranked uh, by the US World University ranking at the best university in the country, in the month 500 best uh, world. We have a college, for example, called Lord Browdy, Academic College in Israel, which is a leading institution in the country. We are headquartered in Geneva, so we have uh, also the UN and UNESCO perspective. And uh, like yourself, I'm a big fan of UNESCO and working with them very closely. We we are driven by the Jewish values, and uh, our uh, project promotes also the Kunula, which is the healing the world philosophy, and promotes social responsibility. So we do many projects on different uh, levels. And from uh, in the last uh, 60 years, we run projects in Africa, Eastern Europe, FSU, Latin America, Asia, and uh, regardless of religion, ethnicity, we work with uh, every uh, segment of the uh, population. And uh, about uh, over 2 million people uh, benefited from all knowledge in uh, 98 uh, different countries. Now we have uh, partners among the others, uh, World Bank, Coca-Cola, Europe Packer, UNESCO, and, uh, and many others. Uh, just, just as an example, for example, in uh, in Liberia, we worked together with the USAID. We trained about 11,000 world-affected young people with professional skills. In Chad, we did it with ExxonMobil and with the Uli Packer, for example, in Ukraine, Russia, South Africa. And we established dozens of NGOs in Albania and Kosovo and trained tens of thousands of countries like Senegal and, and Namibia. Now to, to the topic of discussion, we don't believe that education is the key to everything. It's also the key to fighting anti-Semitism in our case and any kind of bigotry. And this content is just uh, that we speak about uh, really not only about engineering, but uh, having uh, what the university should be dealing with. So for example, uh, uh, only last week, uh, uh, we are uh, working closely with the Global Combat Anti-Semitism Movement. Uh, it's a network of uh, over 200 organizations. And just last week, uh, we have a major dialogue with the Secretary General of the Muslim World League Sheikh Dr. Mohammed Alisa and the senior Jewish leadership, as well as senior U.S. State Department uh, officials, uh, and including many, uh, many academics. Now, in our opinion, education is more than a set of skills, like we discussed here before. It's also the most needed cure. And the question comes now in the post-COVID-19 education. We have future. other 30 seconds. How do we create global, global citizens? And it all we believe that in equal educational rights and diversity, including identities and cultures. So I want to give you an example of uh, Mexico, the Paris University, for example, in Mexico, which is a unique university providing degrees and training for the third uh, sector. And uh, it's aimed at targeting higher education for NGO professionals and volunteers. And uh, really it's uh, training people to make a uh, uh, difference. Uh, so uh, and just to sum up, because I see that uh, there's no time and maybe I'll speak later uh, the intervention. Uh, so uh, from our perspective, uh, and by the way, I'm speaking now from Israel. In Israel, uh, to say to what uh, we, we believe exactly in the opposite of what uh, Marcel said. We believe in diversity of uh, skills. We are, as uh, it's well known, the startup nation, and we are a startup nation because we absorbed your people from more than 100 countries that came, graduated from different universities worldwide. So, just to quickly summarize my short remarks, we are committed to preparing new and transformative leadership in its academic institutions worldwide via sustainable development 
modern education locally and globally. We are committed to use the education as a tool protecting social justice. And we're rapidly adapting our activities in response to COVID-19 in order to meet the contemporary uh, global needs. And we'll be very happy if uh, many of our students will know six or seven languages and uh, it's a very really important thing. So thank you. Thank you very much. I would kindly like to ask you to close the mic if you don't speak. Uh, so, Carol, would you like to be, to have the floor, to be the next one? Thank you. Thank you. So I definitely have um, more of a, of a non-academic look at this. I, I'm not affiliated with the university, but I also see that the type of university and the type of learning for the future uh, is going to really need to be a state of mind and a state of mind that is cultivated from very, very early children and those who work with them. And I also believe it needs to be very participatory because the old model of sort of the lecture-based learning model is not for the new world, how we can flatten the hierarchy and get more people to be exposed and contributing and co-creating both their own learning and then what they can do with that learning. So I think that um, it's not just about what you know from an institution, it's about what you know how to do and what you can go out into the world and, and not only professionally, but also in terms of a service capacity, be able to make major things happen and really move those levers of access and equity. And we know that if we don't get more diverse voices and more diverse people at the table, you know, right now we're in the middle of COVID, we've got racial crises um, all over the world, a lot of health issues and job loss. And we know that the places where there have been the least incidences of death from COVID are in countries that are run by women right now. So um, it's not just a gender piece of it, but it's also that the more diversity of different kinds of people who are at the table, we're developing better systems by which to learn. We're de developing better technology because more kinds of people are using those technologies. And we're really looking at a world where everybody is co-creating the future, not just those from privilege and those from the power structures of old. So I think we're at a really great tipping point in the history of the world to look at the kinds of things that haven't served us the last you know, 60, 70, 100 years, the kinds of things that have and what's really needed, you know, in the new world order. And, um, and, I, and I will just say that those with the least resources right now are those we can empower the most through the new way that learning can take place. So universities and the, you know, world university with WAS and the different kinds of things that can happen at very low cost can put the power of learning and the power of capable work and leadership into the hands of people who before this didn't have those kinds of opportunities. So Global Minded and the reason we're really delighted to work with WAS and the UN is um, we're about creating a capable diverse talent pipeline and we know we cannot solve the sustainable development goals or the toughest problems that we all face without coming together with what we call the uncommon collaborators to really solve in a, in a really new way. So um, I'll uh, end with that and also just say, you know, once again, that it's um, not what students from here on out know, it's about what they know how to do and the ways in which our universities and our educational systems, starting with early childhood, empower that will be the way in which we will turn out, I think from COVID and all kinds of um, other challenges right now, what I wanna call the most courageous generation. And that's what my hope is for all of the young people under 18 who can really solve the, the biggest issues that we're facing from climate to healthcare to equity and education. Thank you. Thank you, Carol. Lisa, please. Great, thank you very much. And um, I'm glad to follow you, Carol, and also to have come here. I don't know, I'm eight or ninth in the list and, and uh, I feel like I can really agree and draw on what others have already articulated. So I wanna start sort of with this question is that can we really agree that education is, uh, is a social good, that education is a human right? Like we, we kind of say this, but we, don't, we haven't said that explicitly. 
Uh, have we said that education is about humanities, culture, science, civic engagement, uh, tackling tough problems? Uh, the Bologna process is great, but it's not addressing uh, the immigration issues we have across the globe or racism or the issue of refugee education. So if we're really thinking about what this, you know, global university is, we must expand, you know, our definition about it. And if we are really saying that education is a means to bring about social justice and equity, then we have to say it's about educating to be human and what that means to be human in a globally connected world today. So we really have to articulate that need for education to support humanity, not just to survive, but to really thrive as a, as a, as a civilization. So what's holding it back? You know, and, and here are just some of uh, the recommendations. Um, you know, world-class educational resources in this context need to be freely available to every learner at every age level and for every subject and domain of interest. That's going to go up against a lot of interests where this private money that Marcel uh, alluded to uh, around who controls these means of production and where are resources and assessments. These are big uh, money-making endeavors in education. Uh, here in the United States, the, the, the commercial publishers are the biggest lobby in education to our government. So we really have to look at, the, we really have to face that, uh, you know, knowledge is going to be most beneficial when it's shared and the learning is most effective when it's collaborative. So I think we have to start with that premise. And of course, creating such a system, you know, it's based on the digital infrastructure, the network, the devices and the softwares. They, they have to be fully supported and funded by governments. And we're seeing this, uh, you know, Carol mentioned about COVID and what's happening today. We're seeing big budget cuts here in the US. We're seeing budget cuts in the EU and the budget around education and culture that didn't really have the funding to support it. So here we are in the most kind of dire need of these things. And we're seeing that, uh, that the funding has been cut. We take private money. We, there's a lot of private money. I, we know that around the world. But then we have to really say who has control of it and, and where do self-interests uh, uh, interfere and how do we mitigate that? Um, you know, also around, uh, I'm a former academic, now I, I run an education NGO that is committed to open educational resources or OER. And uh, we have to look at the open research and planning processes and say, and to also echo what Carol and others have said, who we have to invite people to contribute worldwide, ideas, technology, content, expertise. How do we bring in the young voice, the student voice? So um, anything I think less than that is, is really, we have to be honest that it's not gonna lead us into the direction that is really socially just and educationally sound. And I think that was my timer, wasn't it? Thank you, thank you very much. Alexander? Thank you very much. And welcome to everyone also from my side. I just want to start us off, if that is okay, because the conference is about transformative global leadership. I would like, and it's organized or co-organized by the World Academy for Art of Science. If I may, and if I get extra 30 seconds, I would like to start with a poem and a song that once evoked a whole shift in education for all of us on the planet. But it's a variation of it, but I'm sure you are recognizing it. Um, it's called The Call. We do need new education. We don't need more West control. We do need regeneration. Let us heed this urgent call. Brothers, wake up. Let's transform our schools. Sisters, lead us. Now you write the rules. It is time to script new futures. It's high noon for paradigm births. It is time to learn what roots us. It's for us to save our earth. And let me start with the beginning of the question because it was about world-class education. And I would like to say, and challenge this term because when we hear world class, we probably think about America and Europe. We think about Harvard and Stanford and LSE and such universities. And quite frankly, the education we are enjoying in quotation marks on the planet to now, 
to today or at the moment does not create the kind of leadership we need to build a regenerative future. Actually, it has created a form of leadership that led to hyper individualization, that led us actually to develop a consumerist society that has over exploited the resources of our world. So as educators and educational institutions, we are challenged also to question what has been our role in this situation in which we are as humanity. So hence, I would like to invite a conversation to think from world class to world inclusive. And Alberto, you made this important point. It needs to be an, it needs to be um, an education that invites the full diversity of our planner, planet into our space across gender, across the different cultural voices. Many of you are surely familiar with this huge movements on decolonization of education on the planet, where people really fight the epistemicide that they experience in their societies because local knowledge doesn't have a say in many of the Western or copies of Western institutions to the detriment actually of being um, of use and of value for their society. Many of you, Carol and Lisa, you spoke about participatory learning ecologies, which I think is absolutely invaluable, not just of including um, uh, learners into the process, but to embed also learning and education much more in society to bring it closer to the burning issue. And that is my second point I would like to make to move from world class, one minute I'm concluding already, from world class to world care. We need an education that addresses the burning issues of our time hands on from kindergarten to, to university that has a whole new applications for us as teachers, as catalysts of such learning ecologies and transformative processes. And that is what I would like to, to bring into this very inspiring space. Thank you very much. Thank you, Alexander. Valerie, would you like to go further? I would, thank you very much, Remus. Let thank me say thank you for the invitation. I'm not exactly sure why I'm here. I no longer work in higher education. Um, I, I'm a writer and I've been arguing for uh, transformation in education, I guess, for the last 15 years. Um, my latest book was called Thrive, and I've called it that, picking up with some of the points that Alexandre just made and other colleagues, that I think you have to start, as you did, Remus, with asking what the purpose of these institutions is. And the purpose is no longer credentialing access to the professions, um, transfer of knowledge. I believe with Alexander that the purpose of all our institutions, whether they're preschool or higher education, now needs to be about thriving and not just human flourishing. So Lisa, here I would perhaps disagree with you a little bit because I think there's a, a post-humanist agenda here, which is about a thriving planet as well as thriving humans. And the two we have to see is absolutely integrated. Um, we can't see one without the other, but a, a humanistic, solely humanistic approach, I think is problematic. So if we set that out as our purpose, we have to ask, what is the function of higher education in that? And everyone seems to have taken for granted who higher education is for. I think there are some very fundamental questions that need to be asked because frankly, it has previously been for elites, elites who have been selected out on the basis of an academic sifting and sorting process. Is that what we expect? Um, it follows, if you see higher education as being fundamentally configured around research and with scholarship and research into disciplines being at the very heart of the process. But for most societies, certainly in the global north, there has been an aspiration for many more people, indeed it's implicit in your question, that higher education should be open to all. Do we really mean that? Seriously? That higher education institutions should be available to every single citizen? I rather doubt it because it's right out of kil kilter with what higher education has been about. And let's be quite clear that there are some fundamental questions following on from purpose, who it's for, but also who pays. So Marcel raised some interesting questions there about where money is available, but across most of our societies, we see either government prepared to pay for a proportion of its society, by no means all, 
to have the advantage of higher education. And in some other societies, the user pays because the user is expected to gain benefit. So who pays is a really important question. And right now, post COVID, frankly, the business model for most universities is bust. Most universities, certainly across Australia, New Zealand, Canada, the UK, and many in Europe have depended upon foreign students. And the COVID epidemic has meant that that whole economy of students from other countries coming and migrating across and studying elsewhere no longer works. Secondly, their method of pedagogy, their whole modus operandi is obviously put into question by the possibilities of online lectures being delivered from the very best in the world and the notion of the lecture being the kind of pivot of what everything that a higher education institution does is completely now redundant. So the business model is shot, their modus operandi is shot. I also think that the notion of the transfer of knowledge being at the heart of it is completely inadequate. Carol said, it's not just about what you know, it's about what you do with what you know and how you use it. I would agree with that, but I work with the OECD on its Education 2030 project. And in that we have suggested that it's not the, the unit of knowledge that's critical, it's actually competence. And competence is not the same as skills. Competence is a bucket of four things. It's knowledge, skills, values, and attitudes. And surely we have seen, as Alexander remarked, what we have done to this planet and to our disfigured societies to understand that values have to be at the heart of it. So thinking about competence being the, the key component of what education and higher education too is about, I think is fundamental. Finally, I'd say, that the expectation that higher education leads to great jobs and to better jobs is also now put profoundly in question, not least because of graduate unemployment, but also because after every recession, during every recession, processes of automation get accelerated. They have done in history and they will in this crisis post COVID. Every employer across the world is seeking to drive down their costs through greater automation. So our unemployment issues will become even more critical and it raises the question, what is a good life? A good life used to be determined by getting a high paying job and you know, all of that. But if we are looking at less work available, how is that distributed? And how do we find identity in meaning in our lives? And I think that's what higher education needs to be about. It's about a different vision of what a good life is. And I think higher education has got a big part to play in answering that question but not if you make all the assumptions that seem to have been implicit in quite a lot of this discussion so far. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Janani. Would you like to go further? Thank you, Remus. If there is one thing that this current pandemic and its consequent challenges and complexities has made clear, it is that our education has to foster in our youth, in our future leaders, two important characteristics, faculty for original thinking and positive human values. We are faced with issues we have not seen in a century, not in this magnitude, and it has impacted every aspect of life everywhere in India where I am from. It is forecast that 135 million jobs are going to be lost and 120 million people pushed into poverty. Globally in education, 1.2 billion students are missing school and, and, and countries are already talking about preparing for the next pandemic. So in such a situation, we need people who can think when faced with issues that have no precedence. We need people who can think originally, creatively and holistically. We do need to learn all the subjects, the math, the physics, the history, the geography. In fact, the Indian government has asked all our universities to study the Spanish flu of a century ago to see how it was tackled and overcome so we can learn from it today. We do need all the science labs that are racing to find a vaccine. But equally important is our need for scientists and governments to see the futility of working in competition with each other and instead collaborate to save time, effort, resources, and human lives at such a time and also always. We need leaders who have the honesty and the courage to admit their mistakes, the sincerity to learn from them, 
the humility to seek advice and to listen to scientists. We need decision makers who are uh, clear about what is more important, human life or the vote bank, fixing the blame or solving the problem. So I believe in education, a higher education that is values-based, an education in which accreditation is liberated from instruction, which teaches how to learn and not what to learn is what we need to create uh, leadership for the future. And uh, this way we will not need to be you know, fixing problems. We can even prevent them from occurring. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Lilak. Wasserman. Thank you. Uh, well, uh, it's a pleasure to speak after uh, such an important and inspiring things. It will uh, allow me to just move on from a, a kind of leaning on everything that was said about the central a role of uh, teaching for humanity, uh, changing the models and putting in the center things that has to do with competencies and global citizenship, etc. cetera. Um, I'm coming from a, an organization that works mainly with K-12 education. And from that perspective, I would like to say that the changes in the higher education uh, has a lot to do with changing the education system K-12. Since there are many, many aspects, as Valerie referred to, the uh, clients of higher education being privileged people, that's because we're offering things that are not offered these days at school. The research, the critical thinking, the ana analytics, I'm not talking about subject matters or discipline. I'm, think, I'm talking about things that has to do a lot with competencies. And since we are in a world, as Gianni just described, then starting at school, very early at school, with taking these roles of the academy within the schools would definitely change the models, the operating model and the business model of the higher education. So the first point is taking a lot of the things that are happening these days in a higher education, of course, in a different way, in a, a more, I would say, innovative pedagogy, but uh, take it into the schools. The second point is uh, we still have the academy with a role of preparing young people for the And this preparation is uh, long ago expired even before the COVID and now with the COVID even more, uh, and the collaboration and connection between what happens in the higher education and the world globally, there is an ecosystem of uh, knowledge, competencies, providers that should be in full collaboration with each other, like an open market between supplier and demand, uh, connecting and uh, creating a network that uh, would allow everybody freely. And I'm not sure we have the full model in mind. It's a model that has to be created together with children, with students, with professors, with citizens, diverse as could be, create a network of suppliers and vendors that are educating each other in different models, creating a new world of networks of knowledge that are uh, provided freely to everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Gary, would you like to jump in and to share uh, your opinion? And uh, we told also you didn't have the chance to express yourself on the topic. You just uh, did the introduction. So please consider to join the discussion. The mic, the mic, yeah. we cannot hear. Mm, perhaps uh, since Gary is still here and we probably will move, we could allow him to, uh, to express some views, Gary. Yeah. Okay. No, I, I didn't really come here to express my views. I came here to listen to the rich 
variety of views that you're all expressing. And it's uh, quite fulfilling. Uh, but uh, I think, uh, Gary, uh, that you're hearing some answers to your question. If you would reformulate the educational system, how would that be? How would that be approached? I think there are some answers. And um, as um, Robert mentioned, uh, since there are uh, 10 of us, we have 20 views already. Uh, probably by the end of today, there will be 40 with maybe a hundred <laughs> or a million or a billion. Uh, I think we might do it. So it is not only what I think I have done, but what we could do it as a unit, as a human uh, representatives of a process that is a quintessential existential and as Robert also mentioned, is the key to everything. In that process, there will be mistakes. Uh, and Corona, yes, accelerated, but I think we were ready for around 300 years <laughs> to actually address this problem. And silence after such a question would not be acceptable anymore. So I think, I think it is we are on the path of expanding the horizon of predictability, how we might develop that process. Um, I think that the uh, ideas that Marcel expressed at the beginning of, he used the word unity. Uni unification implies to me the one fits all, the Prussian model from 1770. I don't think Marcel meant it. He meant that we would understand what we ought to know. We would understand the boundaries of the continents. We would understand that sometimes a very uh, rapid and vicious whirlpool can suck us in, inside the black hole and will never show up. It is necessary to know the body of knowledge body of knowledge is the, normally the cumulative understanding and we agree in Europe, in uh, Washington agreement and Lima agreement and many agreements around the globe that if we, our graduates will go somewhere, they, they will know more or less the same. So that constitutes a no body of knowledge that we have to have. Otherwise, it will be very diverse running in all directions. We want to really run for once in one direction. No single person can do that. We all are needed to lead to it. So it's good to know what it is. In addition to body of knowledge, as many of the speakers indicated, we need to have body of experience. That has not been articulated very well in the past. Not only that, in our open system education, that from young, young, young generation going all, all the way through various experiences, collecting experience, not only about skills, but the values, the essence of what is, be, be, uh, what is human and what is becoming human. Um, and knowing the difference well enough to become sooner, perhaps within our lifetime, is requires that process of all of those things being communicated, articulated. When um, Ramos articulated the beautiful idea of UNESCO, I repeated at one of his speeches, that since wars start in our minds, we must teach, we must build, not teach, build um, peace in our minds. And teaching peace is probably good and has, is, is ageless, is timeless. It is us, the teachers, the, those who pretend to be teachers, to understand it fully. It is not about me, about, it's not about you, Larry, uh, Gary. It is about us. It is not even about was, it is not about the UN. Uh, some people, yes, want to disband it, but um, we have bigger issues. 
I think the world world and world structures are important because they probably will erase some of the boundaries. As Alexander mentioned, it is really the desire for us to become, to become humans that matter. Our lives may not matter that much, but our presence on this planet and the, the ability to develop the all. Herschel mentioned in his books and his thinking, um, I asked for all and you gave me. If we will start teaching that anxiety to know how the atom works, how the universe, how our planet works, how the galaxy works and how the universe works, we would realize that in Sagan's words, we are the little tiny blue dot you may remember from your years past, the blue dot, insignificant and so significant. If we could reach that, I think your dreams would be satisfied. Lilac's dreams of dare to dream would be satisfied. And it would be worthwhile to be with you and others because I think we would be going more or less in the same direction, not as one, although oneness is so much, so much attractive to me, but with all of the diversity and all of the comprehension and sensitivities to go to become. And the process of becoming is even more attractive to me. And it has happened in the past. Although we should remember in 1177 BC, we lost <laughs> one civilization. The bronze civilization vanished. There is no rule that would say we will prevail. We must. So just to the component of the answer to, to your concern is should we, we must develop a better education, but we have to learn first how to do it together. So that's my contribution to it. Thank, Thank you. you. I would like to welcome uh, Pavel also. He just uh, joined. I will let you to get accustomed with uh, discussion and atmosphere. Gary, please, if you'd like to add something. I'd be happy to respond. When I look at education, I think of it, I think I commented on this yesterday in some session, as the most important invention that human beings have developed that have brought us as far as we have come out of the forest or out of the rest of the animal kingdom. Our capacity to learn from past experience and pass it on from one generation to the other. It's not technology that has created our advances. It's really the knowledge refined the experience, refined into knowledge and passed on. So in that sense, next to language without which we wouldn't have it, uh, I think it's the greatest invention or development of human civilization. In the same respect though, that if we look at it not for what it is, but for what it isn't, just a mirror image all the problems we have today are still re are reflections of the educational system we have today. And I think instead of thinking about how we incrementally improve this, and I, I can't remember now who said it, but I liked it very much. It's not a world-class system we need. Was it Alexander or Robert? I'm sorry, I forgot. Who, but uh, I totally agree with that. Uh, it's certainly never dreamed in my mind that we're talking about how to take Harvard or Cambridge and, uh, and take it to the rest of the world. To me, that's a nightmare. Uh, uh, the problem is I'm living in India and the problem is that's the model. Uh, I left 
I was an alumni of UC Berkeley and I left California because what I learned did not give me uh, the answers for life. And I found more of that in India than I did in, uh, in higher education in the US. And it would be a nightmare to me. Uh, and it is to some extent because I see all the bright people here wanting to go there uh, and think like Americans and lose uh, the integrity uh, and integrality of the life they have. Uh, I mean, we've mechanized enough of life, we've automated enough of it, we've custom, we've uh, standardized enough of it, uh, we've divorced it enough from the reality of what it is to be human beings already, uh, that we don't need more of that. I would prefer we look at what's missing in our lives and how we need an educational system that's going to give it to us. And a number of you, Janani and others, have, Lisa, have rec uh, resonated with that. Uh, what we're trying to educate or, or help develop are human beings. Uh, the knowledge that we give is going to change very soon. Uh, but the values and the capacity to learn and the capacity to relate are some things we're gonna always need and need much better than we have them today. So I would prefer to think of the education we need as almost a, a complement. I don't wanna say an inverse, it's not an inverse, but it's a complement to what we have, certainly not an improvement on uh, what we have today. And uh, I think a number of you have resonated with it. Thank you for a wonderful discussion. Thank you, uh, Gary. You propose to us to discuss about um, a complicated question, but uh, let me help and uh, do the situation and the discussion more complicated. Because uh, as I mentioned, I studied uh, and I graduated teacher training program. I have been a professor for uh, 30 years by now, and I worked in the national administration of education for almost 20 years and also i know quite a lot about uh, international education but um, let me share i started with a story sharing with you a story while i was student in us now let me share a short story uh, while i was a minister i think it was in my first month as a minister not something new for me because I used to work in the ministry on many positions, including deputy minister and acting minister. So it was not something which it was necessary for me to get accustomed. And I attended, I attended a UNICEF conference of ministers of education in Istanbul. And there I learned uh, education has from, from different people, officials, experts and ministers from other countries, I've learned that we should work for the market, uh, for the labor market. I didn't comment, I just listened, taking notes. But uh, two weeks later, I attended the Council of Ministers of Education in Brussels. And the topic of the discussion among other topics was education and labor market. And I've learned from OECD, we have to serve the labor market. And in that moment, I couldn't stop uh, myself. And I said, you know, I graduated teacher training. I studied a lot. I've learned this. Uh, I discovered this. Our only objective is to serve the labor market. Two weeks ago in Istanbul, I had probably I didn't read enough in the last uh, years. And I did my homework checking the articles, the handbooks, and so on, and also checking the definition of education for 150 years. And I discovered the definition never changed, never mind the country, never mind the time. So from Napoleon or from um, Habsburg uh, Empire to, I don't know, 19th century reforms of education and the 20th century, the definition of education in all languages more or less have three pillars, personal development, citizenship, and labor market. So why are you asking us to drive the system of education just in order to satisfy one pillar? 
the labor market. I don't deny this is an important aspect. But if we go back to the definition, we'll see we have an issue with this definition. And uh, in fact, the problem sits exactly in the definition. Because while I was um, a young uh, pupil and student, what was the meaning of personal development for me? I had in my family teachers and I said, I want to be a teacher and I became a teacher. What was citizenship while I was young? Citizenship was Romania. And what was labor market? Labor market was Romania, more or less. So today, my daughter has different meanings for these three pillars. Personal development, you know, she might be inspired for different things around her, including from internet, uh, Instagram, whatever. She wants to become not a professor like my uh, uncle or my uh, cousin, but she wants to be an actress like someone from United States or I don't know. Citizenship. What does it mean citizenship for my daughter, 17 years old? Romanian, European, global citizenship. If I threw away by mistake a plastic bat uh, um, a bottle, she will react immediately saying, what are you doing? So she's fighting for the uh, preserving the, not the country, not the city, but the world. And labor market, she can work everywhere uh, she wants when she will uh, uh, graduate. And why I put on the table this uh, 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 issue? And you can uh, check, sure, there are different other approach, but more or less we have the same picture of the idea of education. Now, going back to the ministry, what should a minister um, uh, have to do? Because he has limit or she has limited amount of time as a minister in a mandate, limited resources, and you have to plan everything in order to consider, and I totally agree with Lisa, uh, education to be considered as a public good, but let me tell you, and I'm sure you know, not everyone agree with this. And I witnessed a battle, conceptual battle in UNESCO when some countries were supporting the definition of higher education as a public good and other country as a public service. So you are a minister and you have to build policies in order to be uh, assure access and equity but finally, your graduates will not be any longer in Romania, like the medical doctors, or like the uh, computer science uh, uh, engineers, computer engineers. They are traveling uh, around the world and working there. So this is one of the most complicated issue related to education, because in fact, you have to put at, on the same line different conflicting concepts, resources, opinions, and so on. So that was uh, my second intervention. And now, please, I indicated and invited you in the first round. Now, please, if you feel like uh, uh, to add something to the discussion, just ask for the floor. Yeah, Pavel, you haven't had the chance to express yourself. Yes. Uh, my apologies, first of all, I had a, a, a conflict with another uh, meeting and I'm joining you as soon as I can. And um, uh, I'm sorry, I missed part of the discussion, but what I hear from uh, the conversation that I just heard, Ramos, I think part of the story is that we actually are working with two conflicting perspectives of what education is. And one of them is uh, an inherited um, definition that was um, understanding of education as part of uh, a public government supported process, which I think is, is historically rel relatively new because if we think about education in a longer historical perspective, we have to recognize that education is actually a system that has supported human learning. And that would be the most universal definition. 
And now the question is, does that learning only happen at the beginning of our life or is it happening throughout our life? And if we recognize that drawing from, uh, let's say, even ancient methods of supporting human development and up to the modern society that has been created, has created certain institutions around it, we have come to a point that these institutions have in largely become defunct in the sense that they are working not in the support of human learning, individually and collectively, but frequently against it, against what they're supposed to be, against the, the up, uplifting, creating the maximum human potential and embracing our learning journeys throughout life. The question is how to transcend that, how to revert, restore, reconnect with the true origins of what education is, should be, so to say, the platonic ideal of education, which I think Gary so beautifully spoke about and, and we told as well, the idea that education is actually a vehicle for human evolution, potentially. And I think we, in that sense, we can remember as teachers, as practitioners in education, that we can serve that higher mission of education and we can create rules and institutions that would transcend that to that situation. And I'm thinking that we just need to, there is many, many things that we need to do, but I think some of them are really critical. And together with some colleagues, for example, we, we worked quite a lot with Valerie uh, around what can and should be done around this transformation. What are some of the focal points that we can address uh, as leaders that definitely should be there, that if we want to transcend to the next level of human development and use education and recreate education in that capacity. And the most essential one is actually embracing uh, learner capacity, learner uh, the capacity to learn, learner agency, or in a more developed form, it would be self-guided learning. And that is probably very, very central. How can we allow every learner to develop that capacity? How do we create a system that allows to develop it for lifelong learning? And that has to be coupled with developing the capacity of human communities and collectives and teams and organizations to do the same. So we need to create something similar to pedagogy and andragogy that would support this capacity for collective and collaborative learning. And that's the second dimension where a lot has already been done, but we need to move ahead. Third thing is, uh, I think some people probably have mentioned this today, but the idea of learning ecosystems as a new way of governing that would replace the current like more hierarchic, top-down way of organizing learning uh, education in, in a more complex society. We need ecosystemic evolutionary approaches of organizing uh, learning. And finally, we really and urgently need to redefine what, what success means in our society and how do we measure it. So one of the focal points of our attention should be how do we change our measurement systems in the, in, so that we allow and open up possibility for that uh, learning ecosystem to, to step into the world. So these are, I think, the most critical points that we need to focus on as leaders. Thank you. Thank you. Alberto, please. The mic, the mic. I fully agree with the, I heard them. And uh, my quick point, uh, uh, education, uh, we might agree that uh, is uh, certainly about to know, about to do, but uh, without uh, being uh, also centered uh, or to be on value, it's going to be uh, really problematic. The other problem, as I said, that uh, we are not teaching them one uh, obvious thing, sociology of knowledge, which is show that uh, education uh, is a construction uh, and uh, is a narrative uh, that uh, change uh, in, from society to society and on time. And that uh, pedagogy are political statements. So for example, uh, the politics of education uh, are very important, in my opinion, because, very simple, 
to have uh, and pass uh, and make accessible knowledge, uh, updated uh, sound knowledge uh, is uh, power and empowerment. I agree with that. But also to pass uh, obsolete knowledge uh, is a form of disempowerment, is a form of passing fake news uh, as reality. So very, very problematic. And it's a sort of pollution. And uh, last, uh, when I talk about uh, fostering and sustaining learning communities, not everybody together, I agree with Gary in the same word, but common denominators, common denominators, in my opinion, are value and also share humanity experience uh, as wisdom. Let me make uh, just an example. Uh, we have uh, postgraduate courses uh, for medical doctors and clinical psychologists becoming uh, psychotherapists in Italy. We teach them, uh, usually bringing uh, somebody from that culture, about uh, the Navajo tradition of walking in beauty, which means uh, to be deeply connected uh, with life and earth, uh, and they go hunting, and before shooting their arrow, they ask permission uh, to the deer or whatever if they can kill it because they need their meat. Before chopping a tree, they ask uh, the tree permission uh, because they need the wood. And not every time they kill or uh, bring down the tree because the answer, you know, they follow the answer. So I think. Uh, Education, if it's not going to be a problem, is going to help us not to feel all the same, but certainly to feel part of the universe. And second, I really believe that education should be also education to peace. That is another important thing about the healthy society. But also, <laughs> it's one of my many fields, not an expert, but anyhow, Teaching about peace, uh, we're talking about the culture of peace, uh, well, I think it's in many ways obsolete as well. Because if you preach uh, to people, it's not going to work uh, very well. What is uh, leading is the example. And for example, I'm mean involved uh, with a project uh, with the Interparliamentary Coalition for Ethic and Peace uh, that uh, I'm designing a peace training uh, where little kids uh, would teach uh, their parents uh, about the conflict the prevention and resolution uh, and uh, peacemaking. And then another one uh, for teachers, another one uh, for, uh, uh, you know, I, I mean, how can I teach peace uh, if uh, I, Alberto Zucconi, I have not come to terms uh, with the different part of myself. I first have to make peace with myself. Then I'll be more able to have a sustainable relationship uh, with others uh, grounded uh, on peace and respect and understanding. So I think uh, the big challenge uh, for everybody is uh, for a new and more effective education to be more promoter of learning uh, and also to learn of the process. The teacher has to learn, otherwise it's not good teaching. And I hope that uh, I'm going to be, in my uh, last years, learning a lot, because I wouldn't be a good teacher if I wouldn't be a good learner. Thank you, Alberto. Marcelo? Like... Oh. Yes. Ah, Lisa, please. I yes. Think, yeah, I okay. think Lisa, Lisa, after that, Marcelo, after that, Robert. Okay. And Lila, would you like to join? Yeah, okay. So, Lisa. Great, thank you. So, uh, Alberto, thank you for that. It's, uh, you know, it really just struck me about the politics of education that we're talking about here because uh, I, I agree with so much of what everybody has said here today, but it's the politics that also stop us in our tracks. Right. So um, I think recently we were doing some work around open education 
having to do with uh, getting educational resources to refugee camps. And in Jordan, and I may not have all the, the dots connected exactly, but UNESCO was working to help um, get the high school education in the camp so that all young Jordanian and um, all young Syrian refugees could finish their, their high school education. However, in Jordan, uh, they don't allow the refugees from other countries to participate in their higher education systems. And this is just one example of hundreds, if not thousands of political issues that actually uh, thwart our efforts to kind of move forward in these kinds of collaborations and changes. So I would love to think with you all here, we have some fabulous thinkers and innovators and doers, but what are those opportunities to collaborate? I mean, we, we understand these systems, yet when we start talking about the politics, we see, oh, well, I tried that, we couldn't get that through. You know, what are the next steps? And, and of course, I, as a person who's older than this new generation, think so much about how they're just doing it, you know, and what can, how can we include them and be more inclusive in this process? We have access to more power, to more privilege, to these systems. We understand how these things work. Do we need to actually be um, emboldening those younger people to kind of step up and help us really think through how we change these systems? What are the, what is the right next step? That's kind of the question I want to pose here because I think we all agree to so whether we call education a, a human right or a, a public good or a public service, we, we kind of agree conceptually. And of course in academia, we, we write papers and books to disagree about these things with each other. And I think the time is really to move past that to say, what are those next right steps? Thank you. Thank you. Ma yeah, Marcel, Roberto, Lila, Carol. Marcel, three minutes. Three chairman, I have 28 questions here, <laughs> which I've yeah. put together. So yeah. I think it is absolutely possible. But in any case, a number of things which have been said here 60% is what I roughly estimate of what has been sent by the various people about the value and all this kind of stuff that is integrated in what we are doing. But the next step is we are a world academy, a world. We are talking about the whole planet, about China, about Japan, about Russia, about the United States and everything. And I and working in the system on an international scale. And on only the international educational system will bring the peace from Alberto, that will bring a solution for the climate change for Witont. You need the world in order to solve a number of problems. In respect to these so-called immigrants, I don't like to go in detail, I am now setting up in, in uh, in, uh, in the Middle East, uh, uh, yeah, in Jordania, I'm setting up and we are putting the European Union $60 million so that the Syrian students can finish their studies in Jordan. We don't forget anything, but I wanted to say by everything what has been said here, I have tried then to put a kind of a quota, what is the next step to do? And I see that in many of those cases, that is what has been discussed 25, 30 years, 50 years ago. Everybody wants something and to create something, but how to do it? I personally, I have in Europe created like the Erasmus. I got only three doctor degrees for it, Dr. Honoris Causa because the people are changing. And I would say that the minister from Romania, or the chairman, if his daughter is 17, that she goes for Erasmus, that she study for one year in Paris, and that she go for one year in Finland, she will be different. I think what we really need is, we try to understand the world. We try to understand the Chinese. How are they thinking? How are they educating? What is the comparison? And in which way are we going? The same thing with Japan. And I can tell you that I have experienced in some organizations. I have been working for 20 years at CERN in Geneva, in Switzerland. I can tell you that is a model. 
where all the physicists of the whole world are speaking the same language. And they try also to evaluate the value and so on is also there in many of those topics. And I think that we should look into the world academy, not in talking and talking and talking, what are we going to do? What is the roadmap of the future? How can we get the value and how can we get all those elements together and get the force behind and means behind in order to create the so-called world kind of educational system. As education is the pillar for economy, is the pillar for politics, is the pillar for peace. If you speak 40 years ago, for me, Russia was, oh la la, Russia. The same China, who oh, China, who oh, Japan, that are my best friends, are known in China. In Chinua, I was nominated professor in 91, and I'm still there. A very good friend. If you don't know the world, if you don't know the people, if you cannot talk to the people, if the people cannot talk to you, you cannot achieve that the values, what you want. Everybody has its own wish. And I think I would like to see what is the progress about that one. Yesterday there was a meeting about the employment. I think we can solve the employment problems. We don't have to give jobs to people who don't need the jobs, who cannot do the jobs. We really should give the jobs to the people who can do it. They will make a nice family. They will make a nice company. The company will make a nice number of recruitments. There's a number of chains and possibilities. And I can say that in a number of those points which has been made, I really would like to see not how we destruct like it was said yesterday and today, the United Nations or international organizations, they, they don't do their job. We have to, to find others. It's nice to say. We say that the so-called the big bosses, what we had in presidents and ministers, that we have to pre replace it. I would like to see, let us do it. And that is what I'm doing. I like to see and to make a step forward. And the roadmap, how is the education going on? And I, can, uh, I also know about the ethics. I'm writing a book about science and ethics at present. I know about all those elements, but I think we should really think on what is the next step to go. What can we achieve in the world academy? Which way do we have to choose in order to achieve that? How can we get the people with us? I can tell you in my ideas and what I am doing in that way, I have a lot of support. This morning, I talked to the minister in Israel and Israel is completely behind us. If you look about, we have last week the meeting about the new arrangements, what we made with India. And also India, they are really going with. In any case, it is, it is very important that the people go with you. And what I am doing, we take the value of young people, older people, the whole society that we try to take and integrate, integrate into the system. And there are many, many parameters. But we are really making nice progress. There is the money will be there available to create them. There's a lot of support that people want in Europe to have something else. And education is essential to many companies, to many ministries, to many people. And it is just to find the way what is needed, how can we group it together, and what are we doing? But let us make a step forward and not talk around and, uh, you know, problems can be settled. The big problems, what we have today, that are world problems, and we should find to solve them. And one of the peers is education. But still, I have 28 points, which I don't like to take, but I will start and take a note of it uh, yet afterwards. And maybe there is still an opportunity to discuss about the multidisciplinarity, what you have mentioned, uh, about all these points. But I think many people, for many people, it is so evident, the point which you made, that we should have. But it's not always to realize it. And we cannot do it. 
Romania cannot do it. The minister for Romania cannot find a solution. That is absolutely impossible. Forget about that one. But we really have to do it on a completely different way. And I think the World Academy, therefore I'm a member of the World Academy, I, I tried just that angle, which I think is so important in the world. That is, in the academy, I think, when he's talking about economy, and he's talking about all kinds of things, that is nice. We have a president or we have a big boss, Jerry Jacobs do it. But I say, and I feel, that the most important point that the world academy can do is education and to create something for the world. And all your points which you mentioned, we can integrate in one or another way, but we should really make the roadmap how to achieve that on a world basis. That's what I, I do, want to I do say. Share, I do share your ideas. Uh, Gary, I suppose uh, he will uh, support me inviting you in a special session about uh, education. And as a fellow of World Academy of Art and Science, you know, we uh, have uh, many, we have had many opportunities and for sure we'll have in the future to discuss this. I'll be happy to have you a special guest in my university. Now let me go to, because we still have 22 minutes to uh, Robert, after that Lilac, and after that uh, Carol, and after that Alexander, and I suppose uh, probably still have time for one person more. Robert. Well, thank you. First of all, it's really inspiring and uh, diverse the discussion with the diverse opinions. But let's uh, remember that we are a group of uh, like-minders, and all of, all of us are uh, dealing with this issue for many decades, and some of us are involved in different uh, different levels. Now, my my point is that uh, we are probably now facing the most critical junction in the history of uh, at least of the last. Uh, uh, last few decades. I just, uh, like many of you, I guess, I just uh, got a letter a couple of weeks ago from the Director General of UNESCO, from Audrey Ozolai, uh, writing to me that about 95% of the students of the world are out of classes. Some of the students, uh, most of the universities uh, worldwide, are still uh, closed or moved to, uh, to distant, learning, uh, distant learning courses. And the question is, uh, all the issues we discuss here, in this environment, how do you how do you deal with the teaching values? How do you deal with the teaching uh, with social good, citizenship, or how do you teach peace when you do it on, uh, online with the uh, expand of uh, attention of students of a few of a few minutes? And this is before the second wave of uh, of the uh, coronavirus or any other, any other things. And I think that we should really try to focus on how we're dealing with this uh, with these uh, new realities. I think we are uh, pretty much uh, uh, on top of. Uh, of uh, other things, and uh, but to some extent we are talking yesterday's language. We have to understand what what uh, what, we, what we are facing in the next uh, next couple of years, and uh, I don't know how long uh, or what other crisis situations we are going to face. Now the second point is really, and it was mentioned here, but I really want uh, to put a focus on this: is politicization of, uh, of education. Now, I don't want to mention obviously the countries, but you know it's uh, this country first or other country first, or countries are really becoming from. Uh, being uh, global, we have to find a balance. Uh, having this conference under the auspices of the United Nations, uh, with the you know with the, the concept of uh, thinking globally, acting uh, locally. But on the other hand, we have in many countries today acting locally, and uh, let's not care too much about what is happening uh, globally. And obviously, we have to speak about dividing uh, the education from political influence or from the influence of the funders, as it was said here, because in. Uh, Many of the universities, the studies today are according to, uh, to donations uh, that were received. And you have the situation where new faculties are being opened only because uh, there is some, somebody who paid the chair uh, uh, of this uh, subject or things uh, of this kind. I, I also want to revert to what uh, we all said, because I think this is the most, uh, most important thing, is how do we do it together? Because I think we are sitting here, uh, people dealing with education, higher education from, uh, from different countries. and. Uh, it's nice we are meeting at different uh, different conferences. The question is really how we are moving it uh, uh, to next uh, step. And in my opinion, is really uh, the integration, the global integration, at least the part of the knowledge integration, is the key. As I said, I after being uh, living 20 years in uh, London, New York, and uh, some other places, I live now uh, uh, for the last six months in Israel. This country opened it up, 
opened itself up to a different kind of skills from people, uh, people around the world. And this is the only reason why this uh, country is uh, uh, dealing well with the, both with the coronavirus, but also with the, uh, the economic uh, economy and the market, uh, market challenges. And once again, we have to focus uh, on, this, uh, on these uh, issues. And uh, I know that uh, like everybody else, I uh, have more uh, questions uh, than answers, but uh, once again, I think that uh, we have to deal with the new challenges that coronavirus brought uh, to the educational uh, system. And this is the first time that it doesn't matter if you are a billionaire or if you are uh, homeless, you're facing the, the same situation and you are not in the schools and how do you, you're not in the universities and how do you deal with this the challenge of this kind? Thank you. Uh, Lilak, please. You asked for the floor, if I'm not wrong. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I'm just, I, I just want to say that uh, in Israel, we have over 50% of the population that uh, has a certified kind of higher education, which is a lot. And uh, we already see how many people that uh, in the past used to um, strive for a certified hi higher education are no longer interested in the formal higher education. If some of our basic assumption, peace uh, uh, programs for education and all the other amazing stuff that we are talking about would not take place in the formal higher education institution that we know. Because the students are voting with their feet, they won't go there. We already see in Israel a lot of researchers that are going outside the academy by researchers from previously from the academy that are funded by different people with different interests and students, instead of um, taking research uh, chapters within the academy, they do it outside of the academy. Students that want to enter the labor market in that aspect, they don't need certification from the academies anymore. They can study in different channels and they are tested in the labor market according to their current competencies and abilities. So these institutions will no longer be the facilitators of the education in the future. And this is something that we had to take into consideration and keep in mind. It will be an open market of collaboration of networks and the whole approach should be uh, different even in our discussion here. That's it. Carol, and after that, Alexander. Okay. Um, I think those are very valid points. I think we're moving from the old world order of expert to the new world order of novice. And the novice is driving the bus with their questions, with their open mind, with their ability to connect all kinds of different things because they don't have all the answers and they don't know everything. And um, I think that's really powerful. And college and learning is going to be able to relate to different kinds of people for whom different types of contributions are appropriate. So there's going to be a whole range of people and how they learn to get further for their capabilities, their gifts and talents in the world and what they're actually able to go do. But in the past, a lot of learning has really favored those who are the most, you know, analytically gifted or gifted for the type of school that we've done, you know, up through academia and higher education. And so it's left out people with different kinds of abilities and skills and know-how. Like I'm from a family of five. The one in our family, I have four brothers, who's done the best out of all of us, doesn't have a college degree. Um, and I'll say the best, not only in terms of interesting career and financially and all kinds of different, you know, markers. And I think in the new world, there's just a space for self-directed learners, people with the kind of initiative that can just barrel forth when there used to be really strong hierarchical walls, keeping people out of experiences and jobs and even funding for, for their businesses from VCs and that type of thing. So um, that, that's what I'd say is I, I just think a lot of things are shifting and this big pause with COVID and the job shakeouts and everything else, I think is really gonna cause, you know, things to look different. And a lot of the, you know, the major schools that are the leaders around the world will always be um, leading because there will always be students to go to those brand name schools. I think a lot of the other kinds of schools are the ones um, where the community colleges and some of the schools that provide online learning for little or no cost 
is going to empower all kinds of people who have the one thing they need, which is motivation to succeed. And I'll just say, it's been, you know, really interesting to be with all of you and, um, you know, look forward to really figuring out bigger ways we can solve. Alexander. Pavel. Yes, thanks, Ramos. And um, Carl, I want to build a bit on you on the shift that we are seeing in this world. And I would really like to come back to what is bothering me from the bottom of my heart. I believe that we are perhaps underestimating the crisis in this conversation that I feel humanity and the planet is in, and that we are underestimating the role of the university in education that it has played in bringing us into this crisis. So I actually profoundly disagree that we need to move forward and expand what we do, but there is a certain level of creative destruction necessary because, and back to the opening question, Remo, that you brought, what is the purpose of the university of any educational institution? I believe it's societal renewal. We need to deliver on really renew our society so we can live in a regenerative way. And I would like to put a new term into the conversation, which I was inspired to bring, Alberto, by your beautiful Navarro story, which I feel that education needs to be life-based. We need to consider life as a whole and move to degree away from a purely anthropocentric perspective on education. And that would mean that we also would want to embed a whole person perspective. If we don't begin to see ourselves anew as humans embedded in life, we will not be able to design an education that is supporting life, we include it, but we are not the only ones on the planet as we know. And so I was, would like to advocate also for a science, which is an outer science, understanding the phenomena in the outer world and a science which is understanding the phenomena of the inner world, the spiritual dimension that we are holding and that makes us also human. And in that sense, I'm looking much forward to more of this fantastic dialogue that has took place here. And Lisa, you brought this issue potently into the conversation. How do we go on and how do we get into higher levels of resonance between all of us so we can shift also in a more regenerative um, and I do think um, VAS will play an important role here as a, one of the meta conveners together with others. And I'm looking forward to continue to be part of the conversation. And thank you to everyone. Pavel. Pavel, you have the floor. Uh, I wholeheartedly agree with, uh, with the idea that uh, education has to put life regeneration at the center of its mission and um, tomorrow we will have tomorrow morning we will have a, another session that is actually dedicated to that to the question how can education serve the societal transformation so i welcome you to come to the session and join us uh, but in regard to what we are discussing here i think we are seeing like many facets of a very complex process happening and I would like to bring us to the context of the discussion. We are discussing this as part of the project that on global leadership for 21st century. So my question to all of us would be not, the, not only what needs to be done, but what kind of leadership is required to carry forward this transformation that is needed. And I would echo what Lilak was saying, that it's not the mission of one single entity, one single group to carry this transformation forward. It's a multi-stakeholder process where probably we'll, we'll have different paradigms, different approaches, sometimes conflicting approaches, moving ahead. We need to learn how to dance with this complexity. We need to learn how to, you see on, on the, my, my back, how to weave, weave this process because it's, it's a multi-thread multi process where many narratives, many approaches need to be tied together. And, and that's, that's, I think, the mission of conversations like this. But we have to remember there are many more groups that are holding these conversations right now. We need to, they hold them come from completely different perspective. The question is, how do we move forward together? What kind of leadership is able to hold space for all of these processes happening at the same time. 
And I think that's what we need to cultivate within ourselves and what, that's what we need to cultivate within the communities that we are working with. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we still have uh, eight minutes. I, uh, please, you go ahead before uh, to conclude. Okay. <clears throat> so, um, since we are no, closing, no, no, we'll uh, have... Uh, okay. No, Jan Janani, Janani asked for the floor and after that we conclude, okay. please. Thank you. Thank you, Janani. There is a question about massive open online courses and some comments that I would like to address. Yeah. Yeah, we please do it. I had also on my mind, but do it Doug, if you want. We used to keep saying that MOOCs are going to be part of future education and that would have taken time and the change would have met with resistance as most changes are. But the situation today has, has brought that future to us a little faster than, than most expected. And now I feel MOOCs, open education resources and all forms of distance and online education are going to be an integral part of education at all levels. And so now we need to set right all its weaknesses. And then we will have used these difficult times to move more quickly than it would have been otherwise possible to make a progressive change. I, I spoke about you know, values and integrated thinking earlier. I believe that we also need to integrate technology so that we can have the you know, best of all that is available to us. Thank you. Yeah. We told, would you like to add something before to conclude? Okay. Um, thank you very much for uh, your uh, uh, interventions. We, do, we don't have time. Practically the, the conference, the session will be uh, closed in five minutes. Uh, as I said from the beginning, I don't know the answer, but uh, you know, there are different ways of answer a question. When I was a student, I discovered a book about definitions, methodologies, how to define something. I never considered something like this can be. So you can define something depending on the perspectives that you consider, on the people who is asking and people who is uh, uh, answering. So there are many, many ways of trying to answer a question. And I do believe this is the answer. The, the, all the opinions together of different people will help us somehow to shape a definition of the university of the future. And I said earlier, I really like UNESCO. I, maybe I don't like some policies, maybe I don't like some people, but I like UNESCO and the idea of UNESCO because it's a forum when we can go and discuss about this and we can agree or don't agree on topics, but it's a place where we know in an institutionalized way, we try to find answers because in fact, many times we, we identify problems, but we don't know the methodology to approach these problems. And I am a university professor. I am not the one, you know, approving policies. Policies are approved by government. And if we talk about bigger policies to cover some regions, we are talking about Bologna, we are talking about uh, kids in different parts of the world not being able, families not being able to take care of them. UNICEF, UNESCO uh, are there to help and these are intergovernmental organizations, and they have the mandate to try to do this. How we can contribute, we can contribute in different ways. And the way we uh, run this session, it's one way of contributing because in the academia, in the public opinion, in the, in the government, we have to go and to say, uh, you say NATO uh, countries, it's important to pay 2% of GDP for uh, army. But why is not important to pay 5% of GDP for education? Oh. Or why is not important to lo look at access and equity policies, which has, are very, very old wounds of our society. Kids with a low social economic background having no chance to go to education, generally speaking, or to higher education. So these are the kind of solutions uh, and ideas that we have to push and put pressure on the government to
to address what Marcel mentioned, and I do uh, uh, enjoy, have enjoyed and contributed to Bologna. Bologna in Europe, just in Europe, it's a very good example how we can calibrate our policies. Education in Romania is not the same with education in Germany or in France, but we have calibrated our higher education uh, institutions in order to be able to talk among us. And also we accepted, I was member for many years in Bologna follow-up group, and after that I was minister in Bologna ministerial conference. During the years, we arrived to have more or less the same meaning on the main uh, 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 topics. And this is uh, maybe one way of trying to foresee the future. And I do agree when we say, uh, what is the university of the future to be able to include all people? We are not talking about one institution. We are talking about one philosophy. One philosophy that will be respected by uh, people from academia, by people from societies, different societies, and by government. And yesterday I attended uh, the opening, I, I was following the opening um, uh, sessions, and uh, some, uh, I think David mentioned the uh, continuing uh, topics of reforming United Nations and so on. But I have a simple question. Why we don't, be, before to start to reform something, why we don't check what our countries promised to do in the last 50 years as they have not done, including in education. Before to reform education, is, maybe it's easier, and I, I know exactly what I'm talking about because I am a former minister of education. It's easier to look at, to look at a very small topic, children left behind. We don't know how to put them back in the education system and society, we know exactly. We don't have resources, we have it. Why we don't do it? Because we are not organized, we are not committed as countries, as governments. And it's easier to blame from one government to another than to do the work. And I'm talking about countries in Europe, not in Africa or in Asia or in other countries. UK, Romania, Spain among countries with the highest rate of kids left behind. So in countries where normally such kind of problems is not acceptable to, to have it. So maybe before to think at big jumps in the future, we just look at what we are not doing, the homework that we haven't been able to address, but at the same time, we have to be flexible for the future because it's true, we didn't talk too much about online education, but this will be a very, very big challenge of the idea of institution of education because we will replace the concept of school, high school, teacher, professor, university with the idea of educator. And educator can be Google, can be Khan Academy, can be uh, an open speech on YouTube recorded by a 21 years old uh, student. So we have to be open to try to understand how the idea of education of our kids and not just our kids, education also for us, because uh, we told just in the previous session, you, you uh, pictured uh, a graph with lifelong learning uh, 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 idea. So education, will not be associated any longer with one part of our life, but it will be associated with our life. Thank you very much to everyone. And Amos. I really have Amos. enjoyed the discussion. Okay, okay. I'm sorry we didn't have the enough, enough time to express all our ideas and questions, but that is an invitation to go further with this kind of sessions. Thank you very Amos. much. Remus, uh, just to also add a few words. Yeah, um, I, I, at one moment I asked yeah, for no. you, but yeah, please. Um, thank you so much for your contributions. Uh, one thing more. Um, we have to somewhat re remember uh, the idea that was introduced by uh, Joshua Berlin, the freedom duality of freedom, freedom from and freedom to. 
The, this also very much links with the uh, philosophy of Martin Buber, Ich und Du. Um, it, we have to move our philosophy of thinking from I, centered universe, to us, to life, centers universe. Uh, in that, uh, I think we have a chance because as uh, all of you mentioned, we have various ideas, but we have to also work on those ideas. Countries promise various things, but countries are again not um, us. We have to somewhat mobilize to create what Pavel is up to, what, what all of us are up to, to create a condition in which all of us will matter. So very few lives will be left behind. I would like to again thank you for your attention. And I, I strongly believe that we can do it. We have been doing it. And our children and my one-year-old daughter today will be doing it. I know for a fact. And that's, I feel that this conference is helping in articulating the things that could be done and how it could be done. But if, as long as we will forget Buba in that equation, I think we will be lost sooner than later because the forces are huge. The hor or our horizon of predictability is not that great. So all the best to all of you. Thank you so much from both Remus and I. Thank Bye. You. Thank you. Bye-bye. Fabulous discussion.